Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and taking us through the Can history. Can you tell us who you are, please? Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Natasha from the World Bank Country <coughs> Office in Mozambique. So um, thank you very much for the presentation and taking us through some of the reform processes in Mozambique. Now, my question is about the current and the looking forward. So many things in Mozambique are evolving, and we've been discussing at length this morning about the importance of the political economy and political processes. And to put that in context, in Mozambique, you have significant amounts of natural resources coming on stream. You have an increase in the debt, debt level, which is through the issuance of local bonds. And you have elections which are forthcoming at the local level this year and at the national level next year. In addition to that, you also have rising political tensions where the opposition party has now said that the peace agreement is over. So in light of all of these political realities, what role can the budget play in preventing a slip back to conflict in this changing political environment? And so in that context, if you could share some more tips or some advice. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure you'll have to think about that one a little bit. <laughs> Let, let's take, uh, there was somebody else over here, please, madam. Thank you. My name is Karin Metal Cueva. I'm from the Swedish Institute for Public Administration. And I've worked previously in, in Mozambique. Um, Following up on the role of external partners and donors, uh, the story about Mozambique uh, and the budget support donors is quite unique. Uh, you had 19 partners uh, giving budget support at a very early stage when the systems weren't really in place, but you had the, the trust and the confidence of many of those uh, despite that. Um, and this also coincided with a lot of international pressure following uh, Rome, Paris, and, and so on, to uh, bring bud uh, aid on budget and use of budget support. That political appetite seems to be uh, decreasing now. So my question is, um, first, if, if these uh, mechanisms are less important for Mozambique in the stage where you are now, where you have more own revenues, still a substantial share of ODA on budget, and also, if, if there are any alternatives for uh, countries, fragile states or countries coming into conflict where the systems aren't in place, uh, but where the use of country systems and the build-up of country systems is still important, are there any alternatives to, to those aid coordination mechanisms that you could think of? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Another difficult question. I'll take uh, one more over here, please, and then uh, we'll... we'll have some answers to that. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Mark Burr from Publish What You Fund. Um, so there was a point made that 40% of the budget in Mozambique is from aid donors. And there was a second point made that that data is not captured very well in the budget. To what extent is that the fault of aid donors for not providing data in a good enough, good enough data in a useful way? And um, what's the, um, the potential for incorporating the data that's now, that the aid donors have committed to provide through um, the International Aid Transparency Initiative, and um, what's the kind of potential that could be realized from doing so? Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, on the <coughs> current situation in Mozambique, the emerging of uh, natural resources like minerals, the election 2013, 2014, and the political tension. Um, First of all, the budget, in my point of view, it is not uh, the initial point. Mm -hmm. It's the final point. Because the budget is the mirror of your face as uh, a government, as uh, the ruling government. You look to the mirror, and it will tell you who you are. But it's your face <laughs> yeah, that uh, you can see in the mirror. It's not the budget that uh, will try to reflect itself <laughs> on you. <laughs> so uh, on that point of view, first of all, the political parties 
in terms of government and the opposition party have to sit and discuss in depth the differences among them. Decide about what to do with Mozambique. And uh, <coughs> my concern is that if we don't do that immediately, mm -hmm. the budget, as usual, will show the real face. And it will be the face of a country in war. So it will come with the military expenditures increasing, <coughs> education decreasing, health decreasing, agriculture decreasing, consolidation of democracy like financial parliament uh, to the judicial system, uh, rule of law, uh, fair uh, decisions and so on will be decreasing and you will have to increase military spending, internal security, all the means. So at that time, the budget will tell you, in the reality, who you are. If you are working for inclusive growth, or you are working to, to keep and sustain the war. So the only way out that the Mozambicans have been presenting is that the dialogue has to be profound enough to solve the differences as soon as possible. So the elections can be run next year in a different environment. Because I think this time it will not be possible to have this of in less than four or five days because the election will be the 20th of November. Mm -hmm. um, as a, a member of, uh, of uh, Mozambican society, I would say that uh, the Mozambicans have been urging the government to do this, jo this work. Because we used to say that uh, the societies have uh, government because they have difficult and complex issues to be solved. Otherwise, they wouldn't have governments to just live. So it's a difficult issue. It's a complex issue. That's why we have governments. That's why we have ruling parties. Otherwise, they wouldn't need to have. Uh, so it has to be solved. The second issue is on, uh, so my point of view is that dialogue is the only way out and uh, very open dialogue with the open mindset, listening and uh, saying, I can do this, but I can do that and that. So the same way in 1992, we managed to achieve an agreement. Now we can achieve the agreement sooner than if we do it two years from now. Mm -hmm. Because we'll have to have rounds, first round, second round, third round, and then you have a peace agreement, long peace agreement document, and so on. But now it can be solved more. Uh, fast and easily. And then in order to sustain that, it will be necessary to embark in a very serious inclusive growth agenda. Mm. And I believe that inclusive growth agenda in Mozambique means the word inclusive, meaning that the majority has to be included. And the majority is working in agriculture in rural areas. 70% of the population of Mozambique lives in agriculture. So any policy mm. of inclusive growth has to be concentrated in this 70%. Otherwise, we can have very good policies for minerals <laughs> where you have a small number of people. We can benefit them. But it will not change the human development index. Mm -hmm. You will have a very good GDP per capita that indicates that in this room, if we are the two of us here, we have a piece of a bread, we eat the bread, I eat the bread alone, <laughs> he doesn't eat, and when we go outside, they say, you know, the GDP per capita, the bread that they eat, if it was half for him <laughs> and half for me. That's the GDP per capita. <laughs> but the Human Development Index, it's the reality. It shows in reality how much he ate of that bread and how much I ate of that bread. So in order to do that, all the policies relate to agriculture, the value chain of agriculture has to pursue the need to increase the income of those people that are living in the agriculture productive sector. When we flourish in agriculture in Mozambique, we will have inclusive growth. Because these people will have different income, different conditions, and different, different living standards. And this agriculture can be stimulated by other sectors like minerals, 
in terms of linkages, mm -hmm. upstream, downstream, collaboration, small and medium enterprises, uh, cooperation among nationals and the foreigners and so on. And that has to be done in an environment that is created for that purpose. Uh, decreasing ODA and uh, what to do in terms of uh, budget. I think, first of all, we have to recognize from the ODA benefit countries and from the ODA supporting countries that the ODA will decrease. This recognition has to be very transparent. No more the same levels of ODA, first of all. Because what we have now is that we have uh, 100 uh, million in the budget and no disbursement on time. And on the 28th of December, we have one disbursement. And uh, the 1st of January, we say there is no capacity of absorption. <laughs> so when do the I have time to absorb? <laughs> the 29, I'm, you know, in the party of end of the year. <laughs> So uh, we have to look at, first of all, that ODA, not because the countries that have supported us for several years in a long-standing friendship and cooperation, they just decide to reduce ODA. It's mm. a reality, the crisis, the sovereign debt, and so on. So they're still supporting us, but we have to say this is the amount, the real amount mm. of money. Second, we countries that have been benefiting by ODA, we have to be more rational more efficient, more effective on the use of those resources. Because it's a, small, a small amount of resources, so we have to be very careful on using them. For the priority sectors, be very selective. The sectors that will create difference, they multiply the effort in terms of investment and uh, well-being of the people. And we have to be innovative, very innovative. Small amount of money from ODA, let's use it in order to multiply mm -hmm. by doing PPP, for mm -hmm. example, uh, uh, North-South cooperation, triangular cooperation, this kind of initiatives that with a small amount of money from ODA, you can multiply with others by using different alternatives and so on. And availability of data. You know, if there is one thing where I almost g gave up, I never give up something. Mm. I almost, just almost gave up, <laughs> was to have this information from the international community. <laughs> <laughs> so the final solution that I did was instead of having statistic coming from the accounting mm -hmm. that it requires the money comes to the central bank, be registered, and then come to the financials, all this procedure that provokes figures for the accounting system to work, I just had a resignation of having statistics. Mm. So I said, okay, it's difficult for you to channel it to a normal system, as the old bank does, as the IMF does, or as the African Development Bank, bank does. But let's at least have statistics in a regular basis so I can take this information to the parliament. So I had this information on a regular basis, and I would incorporate in my report to the parliament saying, well, education didn't receive uh, 50 million, but received 75 million, because I had disbursement of 50, plus this additional information that reflects what the donor has given us in order to support education. And all the indicators of education will change in accordance with the new figures that incorporate the effort from the ODA. Thanks. Thank you. We have two interesting questions uh, from the internet, but I'd, I'd also like to take maybe two or three more questions from the floor. Paolo, please. Thank you. Uh, Paolo De Renzi from the International Budget Partnership. I had the privilege of living in Mozambique for four years while many of the things that uh, uh, Madame Diogo was talking about were happening from 2000 to 2004, and I had the privilege or some would say the self-inflicted suffering of doing a PhD studying Mozambique's uh, public financial management reforms. And uh, at what I found is, is, is somewhat more complex and somewhat less uh, rosy than the picture that has been painted by, by the speakers. And if you 
I mean, there's definitely no doubt that things have improved dramatically and that the budget system in Mozambique today looks very different and much better than it did uh, in, the, in the mid 90s, or let's say the beginning of the second phase that Madame Diogo has uh, spoken about. But if you look at some specific reform areas, it's actually quite interesting to see how, uh, how limited the, the, the real progress has been. Uh, and in my research, I look at uh, budget classification systems, which links back to the program budgeting issue that uh, uh, Renault has spoken about, uh, the MTEF and the IFMIS, or the in, in, in Mozambique, in the Mozambican version, EC Staffet. And it, it's actually, uh, all of these reforms have been very difficult and have taken a long time, and in most cases have not really reached their uh, intended conclusion and their effective functionality. Uh, and, and at least in my research, there's three things that come up in terms of key factors that uh, have prevented these reforms from being uh, a, a true success. And those two of them are more on the government side and one of them is more on the donor side. And I, I'm just going to sort of quickly uh, 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 summarize them and see what uh, uh, the speakers have to, have to say about them. On the government side, we speak a lot about ownership. And although it was very clear that there was a strong ownership from a small group of individuals within the Ministry of Finance, led by uh, Madame Diogo of, you know, throughout most of that period. My research shows that there was actually very limited ownership in the rest of government, and especially in the line ministries that were responsible uh, for implementing these key reforms. And this is true of the MTEF, and is especially very true of the, of the IFMIS, ISISTAFE, took a long time to even get rolled out, mostly because line ministries did not recognize it as a good system that were responding uh, and addressing their problems in financial management. Uh, the, the second issue is an issue of effective, effective reform coordination within the government. Uh, and there, I remember it, it took a long time, and I, I'm not even sure if it ever happened, that the government put together a public financial management strategy, so something that actually spelled out exactly what the, gov what the government wanted to do, rather than simply uh, putting together these, these various, or, or sort of trying to implement various reforms in different places, but also UTRAFE, which was the unit that was set up <coughs> to coordinate p public financial management reforms, ended up being a huge uh, procurement agency for the IFMIS, rather than actually taking this lead role in effectively coordinating the reforms. And then lastly, on the donor side, there was a huge problem of uh, fragmentation of support on the donor side over the years, both in terms of giving a coherent message to the government in terms of what the donor community saw as priorities in the PFM field. So one day was the MTEF, one day was the IFMIS, one day is, it was one certain type of IFMIS rather than another, etc. but also in terms of uh, providing fragmented support. So the, the ways in which the, the technical assistance was being provided was often contradictory. So you would have donors putting money into the uh, easy stuff, a common fund, and at the same time supporting financial management systems within the sectors that were not compatible with easy stuff. Mm. So yeah, these three key factors that in my view, at least from uh, my research, show that there's there have been and there probably continue being huge challenges in implementing PFM reforms in Mozambique. Uh, I was wondering whether the speakers have anything to say about that. Thanks. Thank you, Paolo. Could you pass the microphone to Ivor Beasley here? Thank you. Uh, Ivor Beasley from the World Bank. Um, in an earlier existence when I worked for DFID, I worked on the customs reform project in Mozambique, which was interesting, I think a successful, uh, successful project in some respects, but I think it brought you up against the reality of you know, what it is to create an island of excellence, you know, perhaps when other institutions that you depend on haven't reformed to the same extent, like the courts or the financial police, etc. Um, well, I was uh, particularly interested to hear Madame Diogo's reflections on what Renault was saying about uh, there not necessarily being a choice between, you know, the second stage reforms and the first stage reforms, how you would see the relevance of medium-term expenditure frameworks, perhaps of performance budgeting in the context of Mozambique today. Thanks. Thank you. Could I pass to this gentleman over here, please? Yeah. You have a microphone here. Uh, thank you very much. I have a very brief question. Uh, it is my, uh, I actually, uh, Sorry, the house. announce who you are, please? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I am Babu Ramasubedi from Nepal. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, uh, 
I am quite enthusiastic that how your technical expertise actually helped uh, while you were making the greater political decision as a prime minister. Because the House earlier has come to a conclusion that public financial management system is a function of polity. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. OK. So how to use technical expertise in that context. We have um, two more questions from the internet, both of which I think are very interesting. Uh, the first says, um, Antoinette spoke this morning about the challenge of natural resources to good and sound PFM. Uh, could Madame Diogo please reflect on the challenge of natural resource management in the context of Mozambique and the question of whether the Mozambican PFM system is ready for it? Uh, that's from Soren Kirk Jensen, a consultant with IBP and IPA here in London. And from Mylon Shish, working with DFID in DRC, uh, we have the question, how has budget transparency or participatory budgeting processes helped the budget in making it more efficient, if it has? Um, so may I first ask Renner sure. to respond to those questions, then I'll give you the last word. Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me start with, uh, with Paolo. Look, I... I don't want to be uh, misunderstood here. I think that what I gave is, 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 a, is a nuanced picture of what the PFM system in Mozambique is. I think there are some undeniable successes, successes and there are some undeniable wi limits to those successes. And I, I would submit that actually is the case of any PFM reform um, you know, throughout the world that you will encounter some <laughs> limits to how your change is spreading through the system. So let me take the three causes that you... Uh, first of all, MTEF, PBB, I fully agree with you, and I, in fact, use the example of MTEF and, and, and PBB as some of the things that are, and if miss, as some of the um, elements of the reform that, that haven't quite delivered fully to the, uh, to the full extent of what was in, intended. However, l let me speak to the issue of uh, line ministries. Absolutely. You know, that, that's also what we found when we came in and looked at um, the, uh, the PBB uh, uh, objectives of the government, the PBB reform of the government, the first thing we told them is, look, this is perceived as a, re as a reform of the budget directorate within the Ministry of Finance, whereas it needs to be a reform of the whole of government. If you want to do it seriously, then line ministries have to be front and center. They're not buying into this, and they're not buying into this because you're not addressing their problems. And that's also why they're not really keen to be using your IFMIS, and some of them are developing their own patches, you know, their own, uh, uh, like the health sector was doing at the time. So that's something that the government took on board. Uh, and the BFM for Results program is really focused on bringing the line ministries and finance together with planning. And, and I think it's succeeded in changing the conversation, but of course it's an ongoing challenge to be going beyond the confines of the central finance agencies. On the PFM strategy, since your time, they have come up with a PFM strategy. Uh, we uh, came in to, to advise them on this, and, and we tried to use the opportunity of the PFM strategy to highlight some of the gaps that I just referred to, and to use those gaps as the starting point for the next generation of, of, of reforms. Uh, they've also changed the role of UTRAFE, which is now called SETSIF, and which is now focused squarely on the data center and the, the more processing aspect of, th of things, whereas PFM reform sits squarely with the Treasury now, which is, I think, a good, a good distinction um, uh, in, the, uh, in the way in which it is organized. Fragmentation of support, fully agree with you. I also use that opportunity to respond to the point made by uh, I think it was uh, Matt, uh, uh, somebody over here from the, uh, the, the, the uh, Publish What You Pay uh, initiative. Uh, the bank was one of the first donors in Mozambique to assess the system in order to use it for investment lending purposes. And we are now using the, the, the system, the PFM for Results Project is fully using ECSTAFE. We've tried to bring other donors on board to do that, but it's been a challenge uh, to get them to do that. Um, I, let me not address the natural resources question or the transparency. Maybe I'll leave that for, for uh, uh, our uh, other guests to um, uh, address. Um, and, yeah, uh, 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 I... This, this guest here. Uh, <laughs> for for, for uh, a, a distinguished speaker. Uh, and and on, on the island of excellence, I think that, yes, it, it's a risk that you're running. Uh, and it's happened not just in customs, it's happened in other countries also on the tax side. Uh, when these, uh, these uh, tax administrations, you know, single tax administration have been created, sometimes they've been created, created in isolation. And uh, after a few years, they've started showing their limits. Um, so I think it speaks to the iceberg that we were seeing this morning, that, you know, you can't do these things in isolation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. So you have the final word. Yeah, I have the final word, and I'll use this chance very well. Um, first of all, you should not be afraid of being the center of excellence mm. as a Minister of Planning and Finance. Um, you know, this reminds me, President Samora, the president that led the central planning economy. He nationalized everything and he changed all the procedures everywhere. But he didn't touch the Minister of Finance. <laughs> because he's aware, he was aware that that was the only place where we could not uh, afford to be disorganized. Mm. So like the treasurer of the Queen, you can't disorganize the one that's the center of development of the country. So uh, the inspiration in terms of quality in the government has to come from the Minister of Planning and Finance. We cannot afford to have Minister of Ag Agriculture better organized than the Minister of Planning and Finance. The Minister of Industry and Trade more organized than the Minister of Planning and Finance. So the Minister of Planning and Finance has to be the center of excellence. And everything has to irradiate from that place and evolve the others. So uh, that's why we didn't have any hesitation of starting the reform of custom before the reform of the police. And that's why we still in Mozambique have very serious problem in the police. But custom is you know, performing in a different manner. It is true, still have problems, mm. but if we compare the previous situation and now, it's totally different. Mm. And when we reformed custom, we had one objective. One was to promote the foreign uh, trade in a flexible manner, and that was achieved. And I remember when we replaced the 31 steps for one step, we had to sit and discuss with uh, 25 people. They were saying that that would not work. And finally we discovered that their problem was to lose the job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we called on room, we said, well, first of all, we have job for this gentleman and that gentleman. <laughs> we'll work in that and that place. And uh, having said that, let's discuss the reform. <laughs> and one of them said, oh, minister, we don't need to discuss. The reform are ready, let's implement them. <laughs> <laughs> And we were six months trying to implement. Mm. They were saying, no, we are not ready. You have to change that. You, there's no way. But when we discovered their problem was to lose the bread. Mm. So we had to address that issue. Mm. Um, so the custom reform, it's not a finalized agenda. Still a lot to be done. The second issue that I would like to address is that this reform and financial, public finance administration uh, management <laughs> It's a so complex that in my point of view, it has three stages. One, the green one, when you make this heavy change, you change the way how we do, we work, the procedure and so on. And it's the second phase of maturity. So when you change at that moment, you have the other changing with you, but they are not yet mature. You have to have a time of maturity. And during this period of maturity, you clean, you feed, you put more water and so on in order this fruit to, mat to, ma to become mature. And during this period of time, you can lose or gain. And from what I see in Mozambique, I think the reforms in finance administration, what you call finance administration reform in Mozambique, uh, they are irreversible. The custom reform is irreversible. No official of custom will like to return to the previous situation. No private sector will yeah. accept to go back to the mm -hmm. 31 steps in order to import something, or ask for <laughs> license to make, to make each import mm -hmm. procedure. No informal sector will accept <coughs> to go to the central bank to get uh, $100 in order to import something. They will go to the foreign exchange, uh, uh, the foreign exchange uh, bureau. Uh, bureau. They will get the money in the market and do their own business. 
So there are some reforms that are clearly irreversible. So in terms of maturity, I would say that we have made the maturity in Mozambique. And what you are saying is that it's time for the third phase. Look again and see which step to make. And I think the Minister of Planning and Finance is ready for that. The sectoral ministers are ready for that. This, this argument that the, the sectoral ministers are not involved or they don't feel involved, it, it can't be accepted because uh, no expenditure is done by the Minister of Finance. From the day of the reform mm. up to now, who does all the execution of the budget? Mm. They are the sectoral ministers. They are the ones that give order to the single account mm -hmm. to make the payments. Mm -hmm. Before, who did that was the Minister of Finance. Now who does is the Sotora Ministry. Mm -hmm. Because we have this delegation of the single account for each ministry. And they are responsible for that management directly. They have to fulfill all the rules. Mm -hmm. They cannot pay out of the rules and follow all the procedures and so on. And uh, finally... Could you say something about natural resource extraction? And exactly. Yes. On natural resource extraction. When we discovered that we were going to have this amount of reserves, we decided to do one thing. We said, in the world, we have three kind of countries that have minerals and oil. One group of countries that when they discover oil in the start exploitation of oil, they become poor than before. They have war. They start killing one another. They have all kind of, uh, of disorganization and the setback. That's the first group, group A. And we have the group B of countries that they, when they discover the oil or gas or this kind of, uh, of resources, they stay to the same level of development because they didn't manage to find the best way of using the resources for their own wealth. So they stuck to the same level. This is the exploitation of resources. The agreements don't protect the people in order to benefit from these resources. And we have the third group, group C where after discovering the resources, they advance, they do better, they have uh, uh, different conditions of living, and the country jumps in terms of human development index. GDP, all of them they have, because they have all this oil in their own country. Well, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, in the first and second group, which countries we choose. We went to one, one each one of them. We went to one in the initial situation. <laughs> we had all the information, the wrongdoings, mm -hmm. the bad experience, the lessons. We went to the second. We had all the wrongdoings, the bad experience, and so on. And we went to the third, and we had this good experience. Mm -hmm. And on the third, well, I have to announce that it was Norway. Mm -hmm. It was not UK. We didn't <laughs> get from UK. <laughs> it was Norway. So from the Norwegian experience, we built our own uh, system. All the issue of uh, transparency, we applied for the EFTI, the industry, the initiative. Mm -hmm. We were observers. We are now there, almost members of the initiative. We participate. We made all the changes in the legislation in order to fulfill the rules of the game, the accountability, the involvement of the communities. Oh, everything that is there, we are following. Uh, in terms of sovereign fund, we are organizing ourselves for that. Some people say, yeah, you have a deficit bud budget. Why are you going to make this fund? I said, no. Even if it's just one mythical that we put in that fund, it will be a procedure, a culture of saving for the future. When we are ready, we could put more and so on. So what I would say is that the budget has a very important role in this process. The role of investing in those areas in order to have the multiplying effort in different uh, uh, sectors, the role of bringing these profits to the 
population by putting the money in the right priorities of the country. And so have a situation that uh, by inspiration would like to be the Norwegian case. The other case, uh, you know, we should not mention, unfortunately. <laughs> and transparency. I'm a big believer, strong believer of transparency. Strong believer. It protects. When you are pro transparent, you are protected. People say you are exposed. You are not protected. You are not exposed. You are exposed when you are hiding something and then someone discover you. When you don't hide what should be uh, shared with, with the, the other stakeholders, the transparency brings accountability. Because when you are transparent, demand comes, pressure comes, <coughs> and you can be also uh, asking the others to be accountable to you. Uh, and the discussion with the international community was exactly at that basis. When you are transparent, you can improve faster. Because when you are transparent, the criticism comes on time, you can improve, you have more contributions, more proposals that will come, you process them, you can sit and discuss and use this source of inspiration in order to improve your procedures and so on. So I think the transparency is the best way of, uh, uh, for me it is, uh, 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 you know, an instrument of uh, accelerating the process of development of the country. It's one of the factors that helps the country to move fast. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much to, to both our panelists. Just before we go, I, uh, one announcement, please, um, which is that at the end of this afternoon's proceedings, uh, there will be drinks and food available. Uh, and there is also some space reserved in a pub close by. So if, you're, if you think you might be on your own in London tonight, you don't need to be. You can join us to talk about PFM until the early hours. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you again, Dona Lisa. Thank you, thank you Renaud.